Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Levi Eshkol uh, once went to Al-Aqsa or the Temple Mount and uh, he did like this. I don't know if you know that. And he was asked, uh, is this V for victory? He said, no, this is V for V Kemen von Dannen Arroyskirchen. How did one get out of here? And I, was, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, attending a conference several days ago in which some people described the um, Israeli, what I call the Israeli language, and uh, there were many um, attempts to show how easily it is for an Israeli to read Biblical Hebrew. And the funny thing is that the, the people who showed the example said, oh, this is from, <coughs> you know, this exists in Israeli, this exists in Israeli, they, they said modern Hebrew. But actually when I looked at that, I could understand nothing from the examples. So it was very strange. But then there was one presenter, uh, I do not want to expose the names, um, who actually gave a very beautiful presentation in which he took a sentence from Haaretz, and the sentence was La Memshala Shia Kimut Yecholet Mugbelet Biotel, it moded him at Galha Garin Hairani, sorry for the Israeli, who in the Titapes of Marav Kememshala, Lo Rationalit, Ishlo Yate Ozen, Latunim Rationalim Shala Binyan Hair Rationalit Shel Tehran. And what he said was very perspicacious. He said that although we believe, if we are Semiticists, that the only word here which is not Hebrew is Rationali, Actually, no word here is really from Hebrew when you look at the meaning. But what I was shocked thereafter was that whenever he analyzed a specific word like memshala, for example, and of course memshala in the Bible has nothing to do with memshala today. I mean, of course the meaning is related somehow, but if you read the Bible, it's not government as we know in English. To my great chagrin, this person gave us not the Yiddish or Russian or Polish parallel in the foreign, in quotation marks, language, but rather the English word, as if Memshala in Israeli is a calc of government rather than, let's say, Regierung. I was shocked. Now, why, by the way, I'll give you another example. Mugbal, is it from English limited? Well, I mean, why not Begrenetz? Tnoa, he, he discussed the Tzipi Livni's uh, movement. Is Tnoa for movement? I don't think so. I think Bavegum, etc. I mean, in Russian and in Polish. Now, why did it happen? I mean, there are two reasons. One, maybe the audience did not know Yiddish. So I'm not accusing this specific person. I think that um, his um, presentation was actually the best um, in the conference. Or maybe he knew the Yiddish, but he couldn't care less about it. I don't know. The problem we have in Israel is that most students of Hebrew linguistics, in quotation marks, or what I call Israeli linguistics, do not have the means, the tools, to do what we do in this session, which is to look at the Yiddish component within, Israeli, within the Israeli language. Why is that so? Now, we are at bar -Ilan University, so let me elaborate a little bit on the language uh, requirements at Israeli linguistics at bar -Ilan University. If you study, if you, if you are in love, <coughs> for example, with a tense system, if there is, apparently there is no tense system in Israeli, there is a perfective, imperfective, uh, imperfective aspect. If you would like to write your PhD about the perfective, imperfective aspect on, of Israeli, of the Israeli language, this is the language spoken after Ben Yehuda, etc. Let's say that you took Kvishesh, which is one of the best things that happened in Israel in the last 20 years, in my view, and <coughs> you call the person in charge and say, Nichnasti le Kvishesh, Vani Nosat, Vani Osa Yutan, Vani Choselet Lamakom Shemeno Bati, Haimani Ashalem al Majet. You do not know whether it was in the past, in the future, or in the present. There is no way, there is no time. Now, if you would like to write a PhD about this, you come to bar -Ilan University to study Israeli linguistics. What are the foreign, in quotation marks, languages that you are required, obliged to study, other than English? Anybody knows here? Arabic, of course, and... Aramaic. No, no, no. Russian is not obligatory. By the way, I would have loved Russian to be obligatory. 
Arabic and Aramaic. This is at the BA level. What about the MA level? If you write a thesis, if you do not write a thesis and you write an MA. Sorry? French? No, no. So English we said, Arabic we said, Aramaic we said, Akkadian and Syriac. In other words, you have four <laughs> Semitic languages. English you study not because of government becoming memshala, but rather because English is the lingua franca of the academic world as we see today. By the way, I had no idea that I would be uh, required to speak in English. Uh, it could have been in some uh, other languages, like Italian, maybe. I see Claudia uh, Rosenzweig. Is it Rosenzweig? Here? It is a little super Russian. Uh, my Russian is uh, very basic, but uh, Dovber maybe uh, could have helped me with that, as if, as if he helped me with many other things. Um, now, where was I? Four Semitic languages, English, and astonishingly, in my view, Yiddish is not required. And my question to you is, I mean, I know Arabic. I, I had the pleasure of serving the Israeli Defense Forces, among other things, uh, using Arabic. And I can tell you without any doubt, Arabic did impact Israeli. Absolutely. However, can you compare the impact of Arabic on Israeli to the impact of Yiddish on Israeli? Absolutely not. The impact of Arabic on Israeli is negligible compared to the impact on Israeli of Yiddish, let alone Aramaic. I mean, how did Aramaic impact Israeli? A little bit, yes, it did. However, most of the impact of Aramaic on Israeli goes through Hebrew. Now, what about Akkadian? Is there anybody in the audience today who can tell me how Syriac and Akkadian impacted the Israeli language? And why is it that an MA student at bar -Lan University who does not study for a thesis, for an MA thesis, by the way, if you do a thesis, you don't need to take these extra two languages, why is it that they are required to study Akkadian and Syriac <coughs> and not Yiddish? I am perplexed. I am actually angry. <laughs> Whose fault is it? And with your permission, I would like to talk a little bit in the macro, although I had many micro examples as well. Hopefully we have time for micro examples. Whose fault is it? <coughs> is it the fault of the Semitologists or the Semiticists at bar -Ilan? By the way, bar -Ilan University is just one example. I could have given you Ben Gurion University, etc. I have nothing against bar -Ilan University, on the contrary. Whose fault is it? Is it the Semiticists' fault? Well, I mean, Semiticists, people who are brainwashed to believe that Israeli is Hebrew, we cannot accuse them for doing such a thing. I personally believe it is actually, a lot of it is the fault of Yiddishists in Israel. Let me explain. From what I saw, and look, I would be very happy to stand corrected. I think that Yiddishists in Israel by and large, and this is a generalization just like any linguist does, I mean, language is in fact an abstract ensemble of idiolects, sociolects, ethnolects, etc. <coughs> when I talk about Israeli, I generalize. If, if there is a linguist who tells you that he or she does not generalize, they're either spies or they're lying or they're not linguists. It's impossible. You have to generalize. So if I look at the Yiddishists in Israel, I, I see what I see is this kind of ghetto Yiddishistics. In other words, Yiddish, yeah, it's kind of a very folksy, you know, idiosyncratic, um, let's not make a big deal out of it, let's just stay in this kind of ghetto mindset of Yiddish studies. And therefore, by the way, you don't have too many students of Yiddish, by and large. I'm not saying that there are no revivals from time to time, but Yiddish in Israel is not in a good condition. I mean, it's enough to ask Shmuli Katzmon about how many Yiddish theaters there are in Israel. There is only one, and it's kind of you know, struggling to survive. It's not like... Um, <clears throat> I think that it is actually very depressing that this mindset of the ghetto Yiddishistics in Israel results in the fact that people who study Israel, Israeli linguistics do not have access to Yiddish. In my view, Yiddish should have been a compulsory language, should be a compulsory language to hundreds of students who do not study Yiddish today. Now, why so? I have read many articles before this lecture about the survival of Yiddish within Mendel Moichel's volume, for example, by Ken Frieden. Uh, he has wonderful examples. 
Um, I can give you some examples for that. When Ken Frieden, my friend from Syracuse University, I don't know if you know Ken, talks about Abramovich um, and the survival of Yiddish on, on, within Abramovich, this is not exactly Israeli, it's modern Hebrew. Abramovich, or Mendel Moichel's story, is the grandfather of Israeli, if you want, whereas Ben Yehuda is the father if you're looking for heroes. So, Mesig Zayn becomes Le Hasig, of course, Maflik to Zayn Le Haflig, Koine Shem Geven, Kanalo Shem, Arois Weisen Zayn Chochme, Nit Chakma, etc. He talks about Mendel Moishe's following right, Kmosha Tagoeoti, Azoi Vi'ir Kuk Michon, etc., etc. I could have given you hundreds or thousands of such examples within literature. And I could have also talked about Yaakov Shaptai, Avot Yeshurun. There were wonderful um, researchers that showed very clearly that they were influenced by their grandmother, etc. But Ribono <coughs> Shelolam, I listen to Moroccans, I listen to Mizrahim, to Ethiopians, to Bogans, to Eb. intellectuals, it doesn't matter. They all speak Yiddish when they speak Israeli without even noticing it. So, I mean, my question to you. Why should I analyze a specific small, you know, <coughs> corpus of literature when I can see Yiddish everywhere, whenever any person in Israel opens his mouth? It doesn't matter whether he's Russian. By the way, we will discuss the congruence principle, which is the most important principle in my view. So, when I, I think I gave this example to Dov Bell several years ago about the Moroccan who, um, uh, I think he was a Moroccan, maybe an Iraqi, I don't know who made them um, a commercial for Toto, you know, the lottery, and he said, Ha Toto mekadem et asfot Yisrael, mekadem. Ani memale Toto kol shavua, memale. Az ani shutaf. Now, is this intonation, his own intonation from his mother's, I mean, and this guy was certainly, I think it's a Banai, I'm not sure, he's certainly a non Yiddish speaker. It's a, is it, the, the, sorry? Banai, which one? He's the fruits. Albert 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 Now, does he speak like that because of his grandmother? So I mean, so who cares that Avot Yeshurun's or um, uh, Yaakov Shaptai's grandmother was a Yiddish speaker? Who cares? I mean, also Moroccans in Israel they speak like it. Why? Why is that so? Is it because of an Ashkenazic? Uh, um, a, a cons con conspiracy. I mean, some people say, oh, you're so Ashkenazic, I mean, I'm acute. This is rubbish. This is just because of history. The ones who were here in their masses at the end of the 19th century, in the Fundusiakl, it's not my fault, they were Yiddish speakers. And although they hated Yiddish, and it's obvious, if you listen to Ben Gurion, well, Ben Gurion came later, he hated Yiddish. Otherwise, he would have never told a Holocaust survivor that her language in which she talked about the Holocaust was so remet uh, galutit, uh, so galutic uh, uh, or diasporic and uh, cacophonous. I mean, he would have never said such a thing to a Holocaust survivor. I mean, this is the most tactless thing. It so happens that the people who were here at the beginning were Yiddish speakers. They hated Yiddish, many of them, but unfortunately, well, or fortunately, you cannot deny your roots. You cannot look for some ancientness, which is in this case a Hebrew ancientness, and totally deny your Jewish heritage. And therefore, when a professor from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem tells me confidentially, shouts at me, stop mentioning that the jargon called Yiddish, you self-hating Jew, yeah? I'm not joking. Some people believe that when you mention Yiddish, you are actually a self-hating Jew. Because, of course, if you're not a self-hating Jew, you would have only mentioned Hebrew. I mean, why mention Yiddish, this feeble, feminine, persecuted, homosexual, um, etc., language of the diaspora? Uh, and, of course, all in quotation marks. I mean, this is not, this is not my, my, my words, unfortunately. When I look at the grammar of Israeli, when I look at the fact that you say plastic rather than up plastic or something like that, <coughs> when I look at spin, which means spin rather than is spin, as opposed to, by the way, 
Aplaton in Hebrew, as in Platon, Aplaton, with the, uh, 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 what's it called, Pro prothesis? A few minutes can mean many things. A few, what, what do you mean by few? Few is very few. Okay. Um, when you look at the tzitza, when you look at shrimps, when you look at the syllable structure of Israeli, what you see is Yiddish. In fact, the syllable structure of Israeli is identical to Yiddish, except one thing, that we do not have a syllabic consonant. We cannot say what they say in Czech. Uh, we cannot do that. You can do that in Yiddish. Erstens, you don't need to say Erstens. We say Lincoln, right? Dovber Keller was at Lincoln College at uh, Oxford. We, in, in England, say Lincoln College. But Israeli say Lincoln, you know. That. <coughs> I would like to tell you something about the founder principle and then maybe to end because the founder principle is very important I'm not for a moment saying that Yiddish is the only language that not influenced but shaped or created Israeli Israeli is not Hebrew which is an evolution an organic evolution of Masculic Hebrew which is an organic evolution of Mishnei Hebrew etc this is a totally mistaken description unfortunately prevalent among professors of Hebrew linguistics at this university and at other Israeli universities, which in my view is a shame. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Israeli ab initio, how do you say yanka? You know, it's kind of, how do you say yanka? It's, nourished. sorry? Nourished. Nourished. nourished or derived or from several sources. So we are talking about hybridization rather than organic evolution. The founder principle says that it's not only Yiddish that impacted the Israeli language. If I, for example, can find that in Russian there is Lev Shavu, at the if I find in Polish Lev Shavu, then I would have argued that Lev Shavu in Israeli, of course it is not a Hebrew expression, comes from <coughs> Yiddish, as well as Polish, as well as Russian, just like in Manishma, as an example that I gave several years ago, that does not only come from the census, but also from Stoslishna, from Tzoswichach, from Cese Aude, if you're Romanian, in Italian, Cese Aude. This is in Tehili. Yeah, Romanian. Oh, you're talking about Shavu Lev. Yes, yes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No, no, just say. This is exactly the point, Hilel Todah. The point is, that the congruence principle argues that if I can find the very same component or element in other languages, including, by the way, Hebrew, my necessary conclusion would be to argue that it is not only from Yiddish, but rather from all these languages simultaneously. Why? Why? Because a Romanian who comes to, uh, Nancy Brandes, who comes to Israel does not say Manishma because of Setzach. He says Manishma because of Chesaude, because he's Romanian. Now, if you're very, very knowledgeable with the Bible, you might say Shvulev. Shvul you say Shvulev or Shavulev? Shvulev in the Bible, yeah, but I'm saying how do people say Shavulev or Shvulev? Shavulev. Shavulev. Shavulev, yeah. Yeah, but look, I, I don't care about the, 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 you know, the Academy of the Hebrew language. What I care about are the people. The people do not make mistakes. The native speakers. So he read, Bleshitatcha. True, this is exactly what I'm trying to say. Right. Okay. Now, uh, let me just let me just finish. With your permission, Bell, Bel Kotleman, I dedicated this short presentation, unfortunately too short. I don't know, I mean, are you sure 25 minutes have passed now? Yeah. Um, to a macro disappointment expression of the situation that is happening here with Yiddish studies in Israel as opposed to Hebrew studies etc. What we need is a huge reform. We need to make a distinction between Hebrew linguistics and Israeli linguistics. When you study Hebrew linguistics, Akkadian is actually helpful. When you study Israeli linguistics, it's kind of pre-pre-prehistory if you allow me to use prehistory in such a way. The other thing we have to do, and that's the last sentence, um, recently there was an, a wonderful initiative by the Prime Minister to initiate 
האקדמיה ללשון העברית, house או בית לאומי לשפה העברית, that's a wonderful, that's wonderful news, but I think it would be disappointing, be self-righteous, it would be hubris, it would be blind, it would be whatever you want to add, lack of vision, lack of ma'of, you know, ma'of is vision, I guess, in English, if we just mythologize there, that we speak the language of Isaiah, that every child in Israel can understand the Bible without any problem, this is total rubbish. And Hillel Weiss, of course, will agree with that, that Chilonim in Israel do not understand the Bible. By the way, I'm not sure about the Tiin, <laughs> but they understand the Bible much better. A little bit better. A little bit better. Sorry? Sorry? <coughs> Exactly. Exactly. It's not politically correct. And, 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 and exactly. No, this is my point. I mean, you, you put, it's, it's not politically correct. And I hope that this museum will not be politically correct, but rather it will be a museum that will help other nations who are reviving their languages. And I'm happy to report that there are hundreds of nations these days that are reclaiming their dead languages. It's not only a Hebrew enterprise. But we were so far the most successful ones. Let us help these people. How can we help them? Very simply, we can show them insights about what is revivable and what is unrevivable. Eliezer ben Yehuda and his friends were not stupid. The fact that modern linguistics did not exist does not explain the fact that my pronunciation in Israeli is totally Yiddish. Although my parents did not speak Yiddish. So, even not a few minutes. <laughs> well, uh, if, if we have time for a question or two, I mean, I would like to... Uh, I must comment. Okay. Um, yeah. Since it was an attack on the Hebrew language department, I must... Uh, I must uh, uh, but nothing personal. I know. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the Hebrew language department is called Hebrew and Semitic languages. That's fact, fact number one. Mm. Number two, English and Arabic are not taught in the Hebrew language department. They are taught in other departments. In graduate school, students study, can study um, Semitic languages. They're not, um, they don't have to. But if they want to graduate in modern Hebrew, what you call Israeli Hebrew, then they can take modern languages and it's outside the, the department, it's not in the department, and the recommended languages are Yiddish and Russian and German. We'll have the discussion just, at the end of the okay. session. Well, I, I, I just, 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 want, I just, just want to say, I just want to... To correct the facts. I, I, yeah, the I just, it's yeah, facts. But I just want to, to respond to these uh, alleged shortly, facts. Very shortly, very shortly. Um, they decided, they decided, meaning the University of Bailan, to oblige those MA students who don't write MA thesis to study two additional ancient Semitic languages, including Akkadian and Syriac. Though I understand the rationale for this decision, which is to save courses in Akkadian and other ancient Semitic languages for political reasons, I mean internal political reasons, so let's, let's close the Yiddish department and give, and give work for the Akkadian professors, uh, offered which are not popular, etc. I strongly oppose this unfortunate decision explain, uh, explaining that most MA students in our department are interested in modern Hebrew, which is Israeli, and for its linguistic study of Yiddish, Russian are far more important, etc. Et now this is a person who is more familiar than you in what is obliged to study at the University of Bailan when you study Hebrew linguistics. I'm not, I'm not inventing it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is, what you're saying is It's not modern Hebrew. It's not modern. It's not necessarily But the point is that there is no separation between modern Hebrew and Hebrew. So when you say it's not modern Hebrew, so what are you actually saying? There is no modern Hebrew. There is Hebrew and that's it. So you did not contradict even one point that I expressed in this in this uh, uh, presentation. I repeat, if you want to study Israeli linguistics at bar -Ilan University, you cannot study Israeli linguistics, you have to study Hebrew linguistics, and these are the languages that you have to study. This is, these are the facts, and what you're saying is kind of surprising, because you're part of bar -Ilan University, 
And I'm shocked that you are not familiar with the facts. I believe she's a 